Hello, everybody. Welcome to the video lecture for um, kind of part two here of the chapter two material on our linguistic analysis um, section. So uh, we, where we left off last time, uh, you can see behind me on the chart here. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube later, I know it's mirrored. I've got a solution. I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, here's the chart we had from last time. We talked about linguistic acts and speech acts. And today we're talking about conversational acts. Um, and finishing in this all up. And this is where a lot of the action happens. This is where things get really interesting um, and more complex. Um, and also where I think there might be some cool, surprising things for you. We might call them insights that you might get from this. It's pretty, it's pretty fun stuff to me. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about the video thing. So last time, struggling with figuring out how to use like a whiteboard device here as a way to present uh, stuff and put notes up there while doing the video. Um, there's something weird about my webcam. Uh, I found out on after doing some digging around, troubleshooting. Uh, Skype doesn't interface with this hardware the same way it interfaces with other hardware. And I don't think Skype is going to be the solution. However, we're, we got to keep using Skype because uh, it allows us, in case a lot of people wanted to show up, um, Skype allows for that. My, um, well, I don't need to get into all the details here. Bottom line is, I've got a couple solutions. Um, and one of them is riskier in terms of me being able to have enough space on my computer to finish recording the entire lecture. So I'm not going to use that one this time, but I might try it out next time. But my other sort of plan C in this case is to use um, Microsoft Paint. Good old standby Microsoft Paint. Um, so I'm going to have a digital whiteboard up here um, on the screen for those of you watching it uh, on YouTube later. If you're live in the lecture right now, which is you, Valentina, <laughs> um, I have the whiteboard here. And, uh, and so this will be, I'm, I'm going to try to adjust the video at once I'm switching over to the Microsoft Paint thing that is recorded for everyone else. But it's going to have the same information. Um, but... This way, the people on YouTube won't have it mirrored. But you're you're seeing it non-mirrored, right? Oh, I don't need that. That's fine. I've got this electronic whiteboard that I'll be putting up on the recording screen that I'm using for everyone else. So I think that's going to work for us this time. Um, there's there's some other parts of the class where doing a whiteboard thing will be very important. Um, but uh, I think either this solution will work or uh, that I've, I've got cooked up for this week um, or maybe I'll, I'll, I'm going to keep searching for some other things too. But um, yeah, it'd be much more convenient to just be able to use Skype. But shucks. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, so uh, let's pull this back up here and I'll, maybe I'll kind of walk around here. Oop, am I out of frame? <laughs> There. Uh, what's a way I can do this? So I'm out of the screen for you, Valentina. But let, let's just do a brief recap. I know this is mirrored up right now. Um, oh, here. I'm just going to do this. There we go. Okay. So um, you can see in the little video, for, the, for people on YouTube later, you can see a little tiny video of me here. Hello. Um, but you get to see the whole whiteboard thing. This is really tiny in the way you're seeing it. Um, but you've got the rest of the screen there. And Valentina, you can see everything I'm doing here. So um, we got everyone covered. So just as a brief recap here, the linguistic act level, the speech act level, and the conversational act level of linguistic analysis all combine um, to culminate in what that like intuitive voice in our head tells us what people are saying. So there's this massive amount of integration and synthesis cognitively that's happening whenever we're hearing people speak in everyday contexts, and not everyday contexts, too. Um, but we put it all together, not always in a way that we're conscious of and reflective of, but our minds are doing all of that work for us. Um, and a lot of times, what happens at the conversational act level is sort of the end product. So you're seeing how the sausage is made here. <laughs> That's kind of the, the theoretical story that you're getting. And it starts with this really simple stuff here, with the linguistic act. So here you can see on the screen, boom. I'll use the mouse and my finger to do both formats. Um, the linguistic act level 
is the sort of starting point for all of the rest of this. Remember, as we were talking last time, you get this. Uh, this is according to Austin's linguistic theory. This is where everything begins. And then once this is in place, now you're in a position to be able to understand the speech act meaning. And then when you got both of these in place, now you're in a position to understand um, what's happening at the conversational act level. And you'll see on the picture, I've got this line drawn here. And that's over here. See that line? Um, and I've numbered these with those five questions that are going to be on the exam. So when I give you a, a passage to do this linguistic analysis project worth, with, the first question will be, what is the literal meaning? And your answer is going to take the form of a, a kind of utterance. Um, do you remember me talking about robots speak last time? Like try to rephrase what they said, re-articulate it in a way that only draws the attention to the meaning that we would get out of the basic semantic and syntactic conventions of the language, the dictionary definitions and the basic grammar rules of that language. Moving over to the speech act, once I know what that picture that's painted with the words is, then I can answer the question of what is the speech act. And that's, that's the way I'll word it on the exam. I'll ask, what's the literal meaning? I'll ask, what's the speech act? And here you're telling me what the speaker literally did by passing along the message that they did at the linguistic act level. So that's why we need this first before we can really have the context set to understand the speech act. I need to know what the message is before I can figure out what it would mean for me to share that message with you. So if I'm like, that's a nice hat, you need to know what those, what kind of picture is painted with those words, what, it, what they represent before you can tell, oh, what they're doing is complimenting me on my hat kind of thing. But these are always going to be actions, and that's why your answers for the speech acts will always be uh, a verb or maybe a few verbs that describe what the speaker was doing by making that move of passing that message along. And the things that define those speech acts are these conventions for behavior, or we also talked about them. This is the Wittgenstein contribution to the theory, um, and Wittgenstein uses this term of language games. So how I tell what you've done depends on the message that you're passing along, but also these rules of what, it, what conditions need to be met in order for someone to count as having done a certain action or made a certain gesture. And one thing that I, I wanted to kind of go back to here um, before moving on, um, if, you're, if you've got the lecture notes up, uh, Valentina, I'm going to be pulling those up here on the screen for YouTube people later. Uh, is this it? No, this one. Here we go. Um, the book talks about uh, these set of um, questions that help you define what a speech act is. And I, I just wanted to clarify really explicitly for everybody that this is not a part of the analysis that I'm asking you to do here. Um, these questions are not always relevant in understanding the speech act. The way the book presents it is that um, they, they help us to identify what these conventions for behavior would look like. What are the rules of the language games? Um, I talked about these briefly, like I talked about um, how in the case of the umpire calling a batter out, it matters that it's the umpire that's the one who's, who's uh, passing along the message of the linguistic act level and not like a fan in the stands. So it, like one of the examples here from the book was um, must the speaker or audience hold any special position or role in order for the speaker to perform the speech act? Um, so th that might that doesn't happen for every speech act, but it happens for some of them to define them as the action that they are. So it's not like you need to answer all six of these questions here um, every time you're giving an answer about the speech act. In fact, all I want you to do is just describe what they did. You don't have to explain your answers here. Um, for these first four questions, um, the literal meaning the speech act, and then the stuff I'll be talking about with conversational acts today, you don't have to explain yourself. You have to explain yourself with question five, because that's what question five is about. What generates the implication? What's conditioning it? Why this implication as opposed to some other message? Um, that's that's going to be the hardest part of uh, this section on the exam and the most difficult or complicated, challenging part of the lecture today. But that's what I'm going to be trying to offer a lot of help with. And I've got a lot of uh, tips and advice 
for how to attack this question five. But this is the most demanding one. Question five, in terms of like just get you in the ballpark here, setting expectations, um, it's going to need like a pretty hefty paragraph and err on the side of more rather than less here. Um, that's that'll, that's what will be going on with this ex the question five where you have to explain the conversational implication. Um, but let's get there. So let's get into um, this territory of the conversational act. As another like quick uh, reminder from last time, I'll get this back up again. Um, here we go. Uh, so there's another quick reminder from last time. I actually wrote, um, I didn't put it on that chart there that I've got up on the screen, but I drew a like a line like this to distinguish that what's happening on the Linguistic and Speech Act level is totally different than what's happening at the Conversational Act level. I described these as public and transparent, meaning that as long as you're familiar with these conventions, you get this meaning. It's just a kind of like decoding process. If you know the semantic and syntactic conventions, you know what to do with the inscriptions on the surface or the noises that you hear uh, over sound um, to decode what they represent. And then when you see that behavior, when the person has performed the linguistic act of expressing a meaning in a language, representing an idea through linguistic devices, then you just have to compare that against these conditions for what defines behaviors to see what kind of behavior it was that they performed. And that's what you get at the Speech Act. But over here in the Conversational Act territory, this is where things get clever. This is where you become Sherlock Holmes. This is where uh, you have to infer rather than just apply a, a set of rules to a situation and see what side it falls on with respect to those conventions. This, this is where things get more creative, more imaginative, um, and where you're going to have to draw on a lot more resources than just what you're given in the problem to analyze uh, in order to be able to conduct this type of analysis. Um, I think I got a message here. Someone came in. Oh, Neil's here. Hello. Welcome. Okay. So what what's the meaning that we get here? Let's talk about that first. Um, well, we're going to get something very similar to what you've already seen. We're going to get, on the one hand, the implied meaning. And then we're also going to get the conversational act, an implied doing. So just like you have the linguistic act and the speech act over here. Oh, shoot, I forgot this for the YouTube people. I need to put that screen back down. There we go. Just like you had um, a literal meaning, which is like a represented picture, and then a literal action or doing or performance with the speech act, You've got those same basic meanings here at the Conversational Act level. They've just been messed with a little bit. They've been screwed with. Um, we've taken the basic meanings, and then there's been some modifications. Now, how those modifications make and what conditions them, that's what we're going to get this big theory from Paul Grice that's going to help us understand and explain that. But these meanings are really just modifications of these meanings, with one little exception. Um, I'm going to call the convert just like I'm going to call what's literally done the speech act. I'm going to call the conversational act, like on the exam when I'm asking you this question, like what's the conversational act? That's going to refer to this implied doing. The book defines a conversational act as an effect or intended effect of speaking. And it includes things like an implied meaning. And that's going to be useful. This is me adjusting things a little slightly from how the book describes it, but I think this is helpful. Um, but I'm going to reserve the, the label of the conversational act to refer to the equivalent here in implication of the speech act. Okay, so this implied doing. But that, that definition from the book about an effect or intended effect of speaking is what really what sets apart the conversational act level of meaning. That it's going to involve talk of or sensitivity to intentions, purposes, motives, goals, et cetera, et cetera. These are all kind of just synonyms. And let me plop this into the, um, the little picture I'm creating in Microsoft Paint for everyone who's watching this on YouTube later. 
so that they can understand too. I should put my head to this side. No, no, to this side so that those of you watching on Skype can still read the chart there. So let's get that up here. Um, implied meaning. There. And we got over here the implied doing. And then we also are going to be including here stuff like intentions, motives, goals, purposes. And just like with, um, did I get everything in? Yeah, okay. Just like with uh, the uh, Linguistic Act level and the Speech Act level, your answer to these two questions, questions three and questions and question four, are going to take similar forms. So um, question three will look like a reworded utterance. Okay? And question four will look like a verb or verbs that describe what's going on here. Um, with language of intentions, purposes, motives, and goals showing up. Um, okay, so Oh, uh, before I go to the next thing, a uh, couple other things that might be helpful for, for clarification purposes here. Um, what is that implied meaning? Before we get technical about it and, and start giving it a much more theoretical description here, um, that implied meaning is usually just what that intuitive voice in your head is telling you people mean. So like we had that example uh, from last time about the governor has the brains of a three-year-old. I mean, what if you're just listening to that, like you don't have your philosopher cap on here where you're like analyzing everything. You're just like, what did they say? What, what was the message they're trying to convey or communicate? Well, they're saying that the governor's stupid. There you go. So that would be your answer, implied meaning. Instead of using subtext or an, an implication, you know, passing something along kind of under the radar in a kind of sneaky way, they could have just been blunt and said explicitly what they were implying. And that's what I want you to do in giving this answer uh, for what the implied meaning is. Um, state explicitly what they were implying. To make the implicit explicit is your job, like we've talked about before here. And let me just put that in the chart here on Microsoft Paint. There we go. All right. Um, now a little bit of commentary about this stuff about intentions, purposes, motives, and goals. Okay, so as communicators, we, um, we are multitaskers. I've mentioned that before. And we, we try to pack, as a part of our multitasking, we're trying to pack a lot of information into a small, small space. And if we had to spell everything out explicitly that we intend to convey, that would be less efficient. There, there are really good reasons for why, probably evolutionarily here, we've developed this capacity to use language in more flexible and imaginative ways. One of my uh, go-to examples now, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a huge comic book person, um, and I'm not like the biggest fan of these movies or anything, but the, uh, the Marvel movies, there's a, a character uh, from Guardians of the Galaxy who doesn't understand a metaphor. He, everything is taken literally. He only lives at the linguistic act level of meaning and speech act level. He gets at speech act meanings, but he doesn't get at conversational act levels. Any kind of subtext, um, passive aggressiveness is conversational implication. Anything that's suggestive, um, poetry, double entendres, things like that. That's all the world of implication. Um, so if we were going to have these kinds of hidden messages that are being pushed under the table here, um, what else do we have to work off of as that's a part of linguistic phenomenon? In some ways, these sets of conventions for the Linguistic Act and the Speech Act level kind of cover it. You've got the basic devices, the conventions related to the devices of the language, like the sounds we make, the gestures we make, the facial expressions, the inscriptions on a surface, all that kind of stuff. That's kind of covered at the linguistic act level. You're also getting like images and conceptual meanings there. And the speech act part is like how, uh, what we're doing in terms of overt behavior, 
as a part of expressing these messages. And it's like, well, what else? Where is there some more like logical space with which to play with meaning? And there's one other variable that we haven't covered, and that's people's intentions in speaking. Why are they doing what they're doing? Not just what they're doing, that's a speech act. Why are they doing it? Uh, we are not mind readers. I have many times wished I was a mind reader as a teacher so I could like know what's going on. That's, that's one of the reasons why I like teaching in person rather than on the internet on online classes because I have even less to figure out like how things are going. Um, but I, I've oftentimes wished for that. I want to know like what are, where are things going? Or just when you've had a conversation with someone, you might be like, why are you saying these things to me? Or like, where is this going? Like, where are you trying to take this conversation? It's something we track in ourselves. We know we speak with purposes. There's things that we're hoping to do or to have accomplished by the way that we're acting over here at the ling Linguistic and Speech Act level. Um, and we speculate about it in others. But we don't have perfect knowledge at all. In fact, the only basis we have for figuring out what other people's motives are is looking at their behavior and being like, what would make sense? And that is the core insight that Paul Grice is going to leverage as a part of his theory of how implications get generated. All the Remember on my chart here, the bottom ones are all about how these meanings get created. And so this is going to be the main story here for the rest of the lecture of like, how do these implications get constructed? Where do they come from? And it's going to work off of this principle of basically assuming charity. That when people are behaving, that they're behaving intelligently. They have some purpose. It's not arbitrary. It's not just absurdity. Or maybe it is absurdity, and that's their purpose, right? But we're making some kind of judgment about the motivational context for how someone is speaking. <clears throat> and even with that in place, uh, you might be like me. Before I, I ran across Paul Grice, I mean, actually, the fact that the book call, uses Paul Grice's theory is one of its, like, selling points to me about why I use it as a text. But before I ran into Paul Grice, um, I didn't think that a science of conversational implication was possible. It just seemed like, yeah, it's up to anyone's interpretation. Like, you speculate about what other people's motives are, and there's no ultimate patterns about this. Everything is contingent. It's based on my assumptions and your assumptions and the context of what's happening, the culture, you know, all that kind of stuff. All these contingent things that are different from person to person in time and place. Um, the kind of diversity of all those different ways that people are and the things that we're talking about, all that kind of stuff. But Paul Grice has a good case to make here that there is an underlying universal logic to how this happens. And it's a logic that has to be universal in order for conversational implication to actually function at all. That it can be a means of effective communication, which it obviously is. Because we use conversational implication all the time, and we get by okay about it. Sometimes it, gener it definitely has a higher risk of miscommunication. But maybe you've noticed this too, that even speaking super literally doesn't always work out. Like, I, I definitely met some people who are like, just say what you mean. And, and kind of Americans sometimes have a, have a, it's a broad generalization about American culture, but um, Americans have a little bit more of a tendency to like, want people to wear their heart on their sleeve and be really obvious about everything they're doing, being straightforward and honest, even if it means bluntness um, and not necessarily niceness. Um, again, mileage may vary here, depending on what kind of subculture you're a part of here. But this is something that um, people from other uh, cultures um, on the planet sort of remark about Americans a lot of the time. Anyway, don't. it's a broad generalization. Take it for whatever it's worth. Um, but that could be, you could prefer that, but it just isn't how we work. That even when things are being presented to us very literally and straightforwardly, like I try to do in my lectures, honestly, I try to avoid conversational implication as a way to communicate the class material to you. I want to spell it all out as explicitly as I possibly can and make it obvious. Um, but even there, our minds are always continuing to whirr and look for, and we're sensitive to, motives, intentions, purposes, and goals, and all that good stuff. Um, I got a text. Is this a student trying to find us? Oh, no. OK. OK. Good. Um, sorry about that. So 
that's uh that that's what's going on here with conversational implication at the real rough edges of it uh the early stages here of our analysis um how are we doing uh people in the chat um any questions popping up anything i can help with so far anything i did like quickly that you're like i could hear I'd, i could stand to hear some more about that Oh, uh, you're not you're not able to see the chart. Uh, no, I, I can see the chart, but I, I don't see the chart that well. I can hear some people like trying to find the chart. I'm also talking to some people who are still trying to find the chart. Okay, okay, that's fine. There is a little button in the lower. I, I don't know where you're, what you're on exactly right now, but there's a button in the lower right on the desktop app that has like a little speech bubble, and you can click on that, and then it opens up the chat window. That might might be it. Hmm. Okay, and it, it it's cool to um, use uh, the voice chat here too. I can hear you and and hear your questions. So definitely cultures change on how much they might be relying on implication. Uh, I did my student teaching in the Midwest, and I've lived in the Midwest a couple times, and uh, it's diff definitely different from the Northwest. I have had many friends or, or acquaintances around here in the Seattle area that have moved from the Midwest. They moved out here, and they're like, yeah, people are really weird here. It's like you always hear the joke about Seattleites being like passive-aggressive. Um, and what they're doing is like communicating, but communicating much more through implication than just being straightforward about it. So there can be some differences there. I've mentioned before that cultural, dif um, cultural diversity and cultural difference uh, and contingency shows up at each of these levels. You've got uh, over here at the Linguistic Act level, you have dialects, uh, like regional dialects, and, and even things like inside jokes. Where you you and your friends have like ba basically baptized certain words and phrases as having this kind of representational content that is of semantic convention. Over here, you've got cultural standards for behavior of expectations of like what what are the behavioral norms here? Like what is it? What's the gesture of respect look like? Or you know all that kind of stuff. Over here, with conversational acts, the biggest way in which culture is going to show up is with what we're going to call, we're going to talk about this a lot throughout the quarter, background assumptions. Background assumptions are all the beliefs you have about the world, how it works, what's going on with people psychologically, um, all of that kind of stuff. It's your, it's your general worldview. And you're going to be using that general worldview as a part of setting your expectations for people's behavior. Not just like what it would take in order to do a certain gesture, that's the speech act level, but what would I think is appropriate or sensible or rational under different circumstances. That's also going to be culturally informed too. So again, culture shows up everywhere, but with very different mechanisms that correspond with the mechanisms of these three different sources of linguistic meaning and content. Um, Neil asked, so even a physical gesture could fall into... A conversational act yes so um, I mean there's going to be physical gestures have basic conventions like this right this is like good job awesome I'm good there's lots of I mean there could be a little contextually defined too but 
there, there's a basic convention around this. this is the very least positive thing, right? And there are going to be conventions for behavior around this. Like, um, if you're like, hey, how does my outfit look? And I'm like, hmm, now this is a compliment, right? Like, under those circumstances, what I've done is compliment you. I'm like, hmm, or I've given my approval or something like that. How could it get into conversational act territory? Uh, well, that's what we're going to talk about. But there's nothing in principle that rules out um, passing along messages, painting pictures with your words, that then do actions that won't also have the potential for implied meanings. As just a really basic example here, at least with the, the gesture of this, um, if, uh, well, we're, I'm going to tell you very specifically to don't to to ignore the existence and reality of the phenomenon of irony irony is something we need to avoid in this unit at least for the purposes of homework problems and the exam i'm never going to ask any questions that have conversational implication where you need to pick up on the fact that it's like said ironically um Irony like just messes with everything. It it upsets everything. And the problem is it's kind of like paranoia in that especially the written word can be read with irony no matter what. Like it's it's just it's like the disposition of the listener. If they decide they want to engage the irony engine, it's just gonna like mess around with all the meanings very uh violently. Um it is a mechanism of conversational implication though, and that's why I was gonna about to use it. Like let's say you're skateboarding and you you fall down and I go right? I'm not really saying good job, right? This is the, there's a there's an irony in me like affirming or complimenting you about something that's obviously a mistake or is bad. So that's gonna set up the possibility of an implied meaning there. Um so but let, let's, uh, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit. Maybe, um, Neil, remind me about it and we can kind of come back to uh, this after we get some more of the mechanisms of conversational implication in place. Um, but so far, so good on that? Was what I was saying so far making sense? Okay, awesome. So let's, um, let's get into this. Um, here's, the, here's the full story. So instead of all this preliminary stuff I've been doing so far, to try to kind of get us in the ballpark. Let's go straight in, explicit, what's happening here. Paul Grice's theory is that all conversation happens under this umbrella of expectations for behavior. And that's what it's really all about. So he has these lists of maxims, as he puts them. And these maxims define what my expectations are for people's behavior in linguistic context. So whenever we're communicating with each other, um, I have expectations for what you ought to be doing, or what, I, what I, at least what I expect you to be doing, right? Um, and the first one is that uh, is called the cooperation principle, that I expect people at all times in their conduct in a conversation to be operating uh, to be behaving in a way that furthers a cooperative goal. So that's already getting into this, you know, notion of intentions, motives, purposes, and goals here. That that's that that's the the linchpin of what we have to work with here. This is where we've got room to speculate about what's happening with each other, and then using that as a frame of reference for uh, changing up these meanings of that we got at the linguistic act and speech act levels. Um, he's got four much more detailed maxims. Those are the maxims from the done the reading. You know what's going on here. The quality, quantity, relevance, and manner. Those maxims are split up into smaller rules. But at the big picture level here with the cooperation principle, Paul Grice is saying that basically when it comes to interpreting what people are implying, we give people the charity of the assumption that they're acting rationally. And then basically try to reverse engineer how their behavior is rational. But we're only prompted to do this under certain cases. Um, and I'm going to use this kind of language to describe it. Um, on the one hand, uh, you have the, the literal meaning and the speech act level of meaning. Here, I can put this back up a little bit. The literal, literal meaning, speech act level of meaning. 
So that's on the one hand here. And I'm comparing it against your, uh, my expectations for your behavior. And when you're, what you literally say and do does not square with my expectations, there's what I'm going to call a breach. There's a disconnect here. I'm like, huh? Wait, that, that doesn't make sense. That's not what I expected. And then what I do is I try to throw into this system or make some modifications. I try to throw in implied meanings or modify the meaning that I got of what you literally said and did so that it resolves that breach and brings it back into alignment with the expectations. Sometimes the expectations, you know, the push goes on their side. But most of the time what happen, what's happening here is that I still have my expectations, especially certain expectations, um, and I'm massaging the meaning of what you're saying to make it fit. But in a way that acknowledges the breach. So um, I like this breach resolution language because one of my favorite metaphors for understanding this kind of theoretical phenomenon is human relationships and how human relationships, like a friendship or something, there can be a breach, say, of trust. Like let's say um, we're good friends and you confide in me and then I blab it to somebody else and you're like, Tim, you, um, you, know, you betrayed me. Um, that, that's damaged our relationship in terms of trust. Um, if I'm going to repair the relationship with you, if we're going to restore it or resolve that breach of the relationship, then whatever way I resolve it needs to sort of address the thing that threatened it in the first place. So if the problem here was that I, w I did not act trust in a trustworthy manner with what you confided in me, then me doing other nice things for you or something like won't really make it up. I mean, it might help make up the concern that I'm not, I don't really care about you or something. So if I invest in you in some other way, then maybe that can happen. But the thing that would really repair that that um, distrust that my actions caused um, would be for me to demonstrate trustworthiness with other things in the future. So you confide in me about something else. And if I don't blab about that one, then you're like, oh, okay, all right. Maybe I can trust this guy again, you know? So the, the same thing happens here with the expectations for people's behavior, is that whatever causes this disconnect and this problem also sort of gives you a roadmap for what it would take to solve it. Like what, what kind of implied meaning um, and implied doing this kind of combo is going to resolve that concern. But these, these expectations come in a couple different flavors, and we're going to talk about that. Um, but the basic story here, the, there's a sort of narrative arc. Um, it, remember me saying last time that what we're trying to do with this analysis is kind of like slow down our minds, like put it in slow motion for like how we logically connect the dots here about you know, how we get that, that meaning that that intuitive voice in our head tells us at the end of the day. Um, it usually happens like this, like lightning fast. And we want to slow it down so we can track what's happening here. And the really slowed down story is we figure out the linguistic act meaning, we figure out the speech act meaning, and then we figure out this conversational act meaning. And by the time we're getting to the conversational act level, I'm taking the product of my understanding of what you literally said and literally did, comparing that against the expectations, Recognizing there's something out of whack here, something weird, something strange, something irrational, or at least it, so it appears. And then I creatively solve that problem by making some modification to the meaning. So I can be like, oh, now there's a way in which I'm able to see how your original behavior, which didn't seem to make sense, actually does make sense. It's very similar to when someone tells you a joke, like a clever joke. In fact, most comedy and humor is using like aggressively mechanisms of conversational implication. Um, literal jokes are, or explicit jokes are not usually as very funny. I mean, unless someone's making a point of how weird and absurd it is to not use conversational implication as a way of speaking. Um, but maybe someone has like told you a joke that you didn't get right away. So you're able to kind of feel that transition of that story a little bit more directly or consciously. Um, so initially you don't get the joke. You're like, I don't get it. What's, and then you're like, oh, I get the joke. 
I see. I see what you did there. Ah ha ha. Right, that there's this logical connection between the meaning that you get just out of the basic conventions of language and a purpose of something funny. Something amusing, entertaining, surprising, clever. Uh, I mean, humor comes, there's a whole philosophy of humor out there too. Absurd. Um, things that provoke um, like levity about matters that are not, that are darker, you know, the dark humor, this kind of stuff. There's lots of different forms out there. But what you're trying to do to like make sense of the joke is find some way in which what they literally said and did actually fulfills the purpose of telling jokes, <laughs> right? That, that, that that's one kind of purpose for communication. So that's what's happening with all conversational implication. Walking me through that story is what your job is here uh, with question five, with explaining how the implication is generated. And let's, let's start filling in what we've got here in the chart. So I'm going to draw it here, and then I'm going to put it on the electronic Microsoft Paint thing. Um, but what, what is really driving the car on determining what these implied meanings are going to be are expectations. Expectations that will define rational actions that are a part of the conversation, right? How, what, what are you doing in the conversation makes sense, right? It has, it is um, not arbitrary, but it's done for reasonable motives. These expectations come in two flavors. Some of them are specific, and we would say contingent, and some of them are universal, and we're going to call them necessary. These universal necessary expectations are those expectations we bring to every conversation, no matter the context, no matter the subject matter, no matter the purpose of the conversation. No matter the culture, the, the psychology of the people involved, no matter what, no matter what type of language we're using, all communication, according to Paul Grice, this is Paul Grice's theory, has some expectations we always bring to the table no matter what. And those are the Gricean maxims. Okay, those are the Gricean maxims. So the, the ones you read in the book, and we're going to review them in detail here today. But those Gricean maxims define what Paul Grice thinks are these universal expectations. And sometimes, you know, this happens a lot in philosophy. Philosophers are always interested in what is universal, what is necessary, what's the essence of something, versus and separating that against the things that are contingent. Sometimes um, I think philosophers get, or there's just like a misconception or misperception about them that because they're so interested in figuring out what's universal, they're somehow ignoring diversity or ignoring contingent differences. But if anything, they're more sensitive to them because they recognize that all, all it would take to disprove a statement that something is universal is to find one counterexample. <laughs> so in as much as philosophers are trying to shoulder their burden of proof and justify these theories, it can't just be about look at all the cases in which it is true. It's like, where are those cases where it might not be true? So. Uh, Paul Grice says there's no counterexamples to this. If you can think of some, that'd be fun. Uh, I'd love to explore any any candidates you have as counterexamples to these maxims. Um, there is going to be one little uh, possible thing, but Paul Grice is acknowledging it, so it can be worked around pretty easily. Um, but Paul Grice is saying all other things being equal, these are the expectations we bring to the table, all of us, all the time, no matter what. Now, there's plenty of other things that are expectations that are specific and contingent, though, that don't happen all the time, but only sometimes. And these are informed by background assumptions. For instance, it is my assumption that, um, well, let, uh, oh, okay, let, there's a bunch of examples I could use here. Here's maybe a good one. Um, if I know you personally, and I'm having, so I kind of know what your general temperament is, and I'm having a conversation with you, 
and then you do something that is really out of character, that's going to be a breach. You'll be like, whoa, what just happened there? Like, you don't normally do that. I don't expect you to act like that in a conversation. So something's up. There's something else going on other than just this explicit stuff, the linguistic and speech act levels of meaning. There's, got, there's, some, there's more to the story here to explain why you did something I wasn't expecting you to do. Okay. Um, the Gricey and Maxim stuff is going to be a little bit more like logical stuff um, rather than those like idiosyncrasies of someone's personality. But there's nothing stopping that from also being a part of the story of conversational implication, according to Paul Grice. He's basically saying, my speculation about hidden meanings always needs something to provoke it. It always needs that, that triggering condition. And the triggering condition is when expectations are thwarted. When, as the audience, if you express yourself in a conversation in a way I wasn't expecting, surprising, confounds my expectations, that's going to generate... Um, implication either way. But Paul Grice would also say that in every situation, even if there's some violation of a specific expectation that generates conversational implication, there's also going to be a Gricean maxim that is um, being violated too. So that would be an example. Um, another example might be that uh, Well, like basic things that I might believe about human psychology. Um, that like people wouldn't want to listen to, they would tire of uh, hearing a 20 minute setup for a one liner punchline, like joke punchline. Like that wouldn't be something entertaining to them. <laughs> that might be a background assumption that I'm using as a part of interpreting like what's going on with people. But these background assumptions are, are also not just for identifying a breach, but they're also greatly going to assist in the resolution, and I'm going to explain that too. There, there's, there's a lot more mechanics. I, I'm giving you the theory right now, and after we get done with the theory, I'll give you the like practical I'll give you a practical guide for how to apply this theory in actual cases of analysis. I'll give you kind of a step-by-step -step guideline for what this uh, question five paragraph ought to look like. All right, before I go further, <clears throat> let me clean up the chart that we've got here for uh, everyone on YouTube here. So expectations, and they can be specific, contingent, and those are going to be defined by our background assumptions, which are always different. We all have different background assumptions. We do not have the same background assumptions about the world and people and how everything works. And then um, we have these universal necessary assumptions, and those are defined by the Gricean maxims. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, let me just take stock here. I do want to talk about the Gricean maxims in detail. I think I want to do that last. Um, and, and then we'll do some, and I'll be able to do some examples as we go. But let's get a little bit more of, well, I'm a little torn. Here, I want to uh, see how, how are you doing chat? Any questions popping up so far that I could help with? Anything you, that I could clarify or, or go over again? Okay, cool. Okay, awesome. Maybe I'm just lecturing very clearly. I think this stuff is somewhat challenging and difficult, so I'm, I'm always a little self-conscious about it. But sounds like things are going good for you. Definitely let me know. Don't be shy about uh, asking questions. Um, I, it's a cliche. There are no dumb questions. There's maybe questions that are irrelevant, be, but intentionally so. But if Anything that is a sincere question you've got is relevant and um, would be helpful. If you've got a question, someone else has a question too, for sure. Okay, let's um, yeah, let's just let's just go for this. Uh, so let's let's skip a little bit into the practical application. So when you're actually having to answer uh, this question about um, what's really here, I'm going to make this little bigger here so we got some more space. 
Um, when you're having to answer this question of how is the implication generated, you've got to tell that story. There are two responsibilities that you have in telling that story. So I'm going to call this elements of an excellent explanation of implication. And one of them is that you're going to have to identify the breach. And to do that, that means identifying what Gricean maxim was violated. So whenever people speak um, and they're generating conversational implication, there's going to be some kind of uh, Gricean maxim violation going on if there's going to be any implication. So hunting that down is actually what the first exercise of the homework is asking you to do. Um, it's just giving you examples of people talking and being like, which of the Gricean maxims, which we'll go over in detail, uh, got violated? What was the expectation that this linguistic behavior, in terms of what the person literally said and did, didn't square with the expectations? So that's the first thing you got to do. And then you need to explain the resolution. And that's going to get you to do a couple of things. First, you want to be able to explain how what you have as the implied meaning answer, so that was the answer to question three up there, explain how, I'm, uh, for those of you in the chat, I'm typing this up on an electronic picture whiteboard here for everyone on YouTube, but I'll, I'll write this on the board for you too. Um, explain how the implied meaning is not violating Oh, I should put this as that Gricean maxim. So whatever, if you have a, if the whole thing that generates implication is trying to make sense of something that didn't make sense initially because it violated expectations, if the solution, the implied meaning is the solution there, if that solution is itself violating Gricean maxims, then there's more implication to unpack, right? You, you haven't resolved everything fully. So the, the next thing you need to do is show how the implied meaning that you're coming up with, which usually is what your intuitive voice in your head tells you, but, but not always. Sometimes your intuition is not reliable. I'll give you some advice about what to do if that happens. Um, but it's generally what that's saying. But you need to explain how that implied meaning solves the problem, how it, how it fits the gap. Uh, I also like a metaphor here of like, let's say you got like a block of wood and you've got a hole in it. And whatever is going to be the piece of wood that can fill the hole needs to be the same shape. right? The shape of the hole and the shape of the peg need to match. So if you've got a Gricean maxim violation of relevance, then whatever you think is the implied meaning better be satisfying the relevance maxim instead of violating it. So that's the next thing you'd have to explain. And then you need to explain why choose this implied meaning as the solution instead of something else. I'm going to fix the formatting here. So instead of something else. And to do that, you're going to uh, uh, rely on background assumptions to do your explaining of yourself. So uh, for those of you in the chat, um, I've got this typed up for people on YouTube. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it up here on the board for you. So while you're explaining question five here, um, how is the implication generated, you're going to identify the breach. So, like, uh, actually, I, I didn't say this earlier, but, um, you know, every good story's got a problem. It's got a conflict. And then it's got, and then the, the story is about the solution to that conflict, or maybe the solution is no solution, or, like, there's a lack of re resolution. Some stories do that. Art Nouveau is really famous for that. Um, 
but uh, that's what we've got. You're, you're telling a story here in explaining question five. You're, you're saying, here's the thing that was the problem, and here's how the implied meaning is the solution. That's like your job. So you're a storyteller here. So you have to identify the breach, and the way you're going to go about doing that is by identifying the Bryceian maxim violations. And there can be more than one. You can have multiple violations happening at the same time. This happens. And then you've got to explain the resolution of that breach. And that is a two-step process that involves... Um, oh, are you able to see everything on here? Here, I'm going to turn the camera up there. Okay. Uh, is this all coming into frame? There. Okay. So identify the breach. Identifying rights and maxim violations is how you do that. Explain the resolution. First step here is explain how your choice um, of what the implication is, how the, the implication um, is not violating that Gricean maxim that you identified as the one that was initially violated by what they literally said and did. And then the final step here is explain why choose this implication, this implied meaning over others other possible ways we could have solved that, right? So if I if I know that I need, I've got a square hole, so I need a square peg, there might be a bunch of square pegs around. Why choose this square peg over some other square peg? And that the answer will be uh, by appealing to your background assumptions. Basically, this is what the book talks about when it's talking about how you connect the dots between the literal meaning and the implied meaning. Um, and I'll, I'll, we'll be going through a bunch of examples here, so you'll be able to see me kind of demonstrate this, of how you do this dot connecting. Um, but that's what that's what that's kind of asking for. Is this showing up on the? Let me double check something. Oh, it's sort of out of frame. Okay, there we go. That's now we're good. Okay. Um, so this whole process um, of of doing number five, we'll we'll walk through it and. and now you've, you've got the, the basic description of it, the step-by-step -step description, and we can lean on that as we're running through some examples here. Um, I think this is probably a good time for me to take a break. <laughs> We've been talking for an hour. Um, I'd like to take a little short break. Two hours is a long time to lecture in a row. So maybe for those of you in the chat, I'll just take like a, a little 10-minute break here, and then I'll be right back. Um, and when we get back, we'll talk about the particular Gricean maxims, run through a bunch of examples and illustrations, um, and and then we'll see how much time we've got. I might start doing some, I might describe a, uh, a big assignment that's coming up that's going to help you uh, with preparation for exam one. And exam one is still a little further down the road here, but this will be a little uh, project that you'll be working on through the remaining units that will uh, give you some better practice and preparation for the exam. So I might I might start talking about that. But that's our game plan. Sound good, chat? Any questions before we break? Okay, sweet. All right. Um, maybe something will pop up over the break. Let me know when I get back. And uh, YouTube, this will just take a second for you. All right, we're back. Uh, here's a question from Neil here. Uh, it asks, the book described a situation in which one utterance could be all three acts as one. Is that true? A um, couple things I want to uh, address about answering this question. The first one is that whenever, uh, it's something I said last time too, and so it's really important. It can be easy to forget. Um, whenever we communicate, period, we're doing all three. So all three levels are in effect. It just might be sometimes that 
there's nothing that's really interestingly different about what's happening in terms of the content or substance of the meaning that we're getting at all three levels. But they're always all there. It isn't like some utterances don't have a linguistic act or don't have a speech act or don't have a conversational act. All those levels are always in effect. They're like I describe them as like layers of meaning that are packed in together in, in a meaning um, that we get. The, the ultimate meaning of what was expressed. The linguistic meaning of the utterance has all three levels always involved. But the thing that the book is talking about is how they could uh, basically be all overlapping with each other and not contributing anything that's different at, at each of those levels. So, um, yeah, 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 the, the example of you are invited to my party. Um, explicit performatives that don't violate Gricean maxims are going to be the cases that fit that description. Um, why? Because, one, the meaning that you get at the linguistic act level is directly representing the speech act that is performed. That's what an explicit performative is. The picture that's painted with the words paints the picture of the thing that you're doing. So when you say, you are invited to my party, by saying that, you have thereby invited them. But that doesn't mean, I mean, I guess the, maybe I'm, I'm doing a little theoretical hair splitting here, but there still is a difference between the picture painted by the words and the understanding of the speech act, what's been done by painting that picture. It just so happens that in terms of their conceptual content, they overlap. And if there's no, no violation, no Gricean maxim violations going on, then there won't be anything to provoke any adjustment or modification or distortion or twisting or massaging of that meaning. And so it'll be the same. So that's like what I was describing with my, my lectures. I'm trying as much as possible not to communicate their implication. I want the meaning that you're receiving from me to be exactly what I'm saying taken literally. Um, rather than that I'm expecting you to pick up on some uptake that I'm going for. Um, but there are going to be some cases of my lecturing where um, uh, that would be relevant for Gricean maxim violations, and I'll, I'll talk about that. I'm actually going to use that as an example. Um, is that answering the question for you, Neil? Mm -hmm. Sweet. Awesome. Okay. Um, so going further, the, the next big thing that we got to talk about are the maxims themselves. And there, there's one more general thing I want to say about them. So I, I'm pulling up my lecture notes here uh, for the YouTube people, um, chat people. Uh, so if you want to follow along here with lecture one, um, I'm at this section. This is on page three of seven called Conversational Acts, uh, the main course. And that's where we have uh, the cooperation principle. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Paul Grice words it like this. Make your conversational contribution such as is required at the stage at which it occurs by the accepted purpose or direction of the talk exchange in which you are engaged. So again, it's saying, uh, it's expressing a expectation that you're going to act in a rational way toward whatever is the purpose of the conversation. Now, what I wanted to remark on here is that all of Grice's maxims are worded like commands. They're all, uh, you should do this, I, you ought to do this. But there's a, there's a subtlety here that I really want to emphasize. Paul Grice is not saying that the extent to which you don't play by these rules is the extent to which you miscommunicate or fail to communicate. That's not how this works. What the maxims um, prescribe as rules is really just defining, like I was talking about earlier, this set of expectations. And the whole story that Paul Grice is telling, theoretically, about conversational implication is that we communicate by violating those rules. That basically, I can count on as the speaker, let's say you're the audience, I'm the speaker, when I'm expressing myself, I can count on the fact that you are a rational listener. And if I do something weird, you're going to go looking for an implied meaning that's going to make sense of it. So it's kind of like, as the speaker, I can intentionally violate Gricean maxims. I can flaunt my violation of them to make it really obvious that I'm not doing what is expected. Um, and in the process, I'm leaving a kind of a trail of breadcrumbs that I'm like, you'll be able to pick up on it. 
you can you can figure out where I'm going with this kind of thing. That's how subtext works. Um, let's go back to passive aggression as an example. I just because I was just thinking of breadcrumbs. I thought of an example from my college years when I was living in a house with people. And uh, you know when you live in a house with a bunch of people, people have different standards of cleanliness and they can step on each other's toes and. I remember one morning we were waking up from, uh, it was a Saturday morning, we'd had a big party the night before, and we're all like rolling out of bed, going to make breakfast together, and we get up, and one of our housemates, who's an early riser and is definitely one of these clean people, uh, just left a piece of paper that on, on the countertop that just said, crumbs, and then arrows pointing in all directions, and uh, you know, it, this is this is a uh, it's a Gracie Maxim violation um, be, because of well, there's a couple violations. It could be a it could be a quantity violation here. It's also going to be a relevance violation for sure. Um, but it's like he's like you'll figure out what I mean. And what his real meaning, the implied meaning is, um, please clean up after yourselves. And probably also, I am displeased with what has happened. <laughs> Um, but he left that message. It's a passive-aggressive message. Um, but he was like, they're going to get the message. I don't need to spell it all out. All I need to say is crumbs. That's it. All he's doing is like calling our attention to it. Um, yeah, so um, that that's how this works. So it's not like you must fulfill Paul Grice's maxims in order to be a successful communicator. You can violate the maxims and be a communicator and probably a more effective communicator in certain contexts and certain purposes that's going to be preferable uh, because like I was saying earlier conversational implication is a way that we're able to kill two birds with one stone or more it's a way which, which we're able to pack in a lot of nuanced meaning into a small space one of the height uh, um, one of the highest examples of this or most extreme examples of that is poetry um, poems, oftentimes, like really good poems, oftentimes have a lot of meaning packed into a very small number of words. But that meaning has to be found, right? You have to read the poem carefully and like think about it and take it slow. It may not jump right off the page and telling you what its meaning is. Um, there's always the danger with poetry of like ambiguous meaning, like the poet might be leaving that trail of breadcrumbs, and maybe not everyone picks up on that trail of breadcrumbs. They they're not able to to connect all the dots and piece it all together. But but that's another example here of what Paul Grice is talking about. That um, he's or what I'm saying about Paul Grice's maxims. That while they're worded like commands, they aren't like commands like say on the code of intellectual conduct. On the code of intellectual conduct, it's like, here are the rules, and if you don't follow these rules, I mean, you're damaging your ability to fulfill the purpose of a intellectual debate um, in its you know, concern about the truth and its concern about ethical treatment of others. There, one, one thing that's actually another kind of noteworthy footnote here is that there, is a remar there are some remarkable parallels between Paul Grice's maxims of conversational implication and the principles on the code of intellectual conduct the listing of these intellectual virtues. Um, but the context here is different. Um, Grice is not talking about, here's what you have to do to be successful at communicating the way that the code is offering the principles that are going to help you be a successful truth seeker. Um, all he's doing is articulating these basic expectations we have for people's behavior. That's it. So they're not, um, they're not rules so much as general guidelines that we all are on the same page about. That's why I was saying earlier, like they have to be universal in order for them to be able to have this this role in successful communication. If I'm leaving a trail of breadcrumbs and you're like that character, I forget his name from Guardians of the Galaxy, like we're not going to be able to successfully communicate. I, as the speaker, am taking it for granted that you have those expectations, so I purposefully thwart them in order to get you to come up with a different meaning than what I'm just literally and explicitly saying. And, and again, uh, if this sounds annoying and complicated, and like why don't people just speak straightforwardly, keep in mind that, again, you're really smart. You don't have to think through most of this stuff most of the time. You pick up on the subtext like that. Your intuition puts it all together, and that little voice in your head barfs it all out, and, and there you are. 
Okay, so um, I hopefully, I feel like maybe I'm beating a dead horse a little bit here, but uh, I'm trying to, I, I definitely want to give adequate, uh, as much explanation as I possibly can here to, to uh, make Grice's theory kind of come off the page so you can see what's happening with it. Okay, let's talk about the details of these Gricean maxims themselves. All of them are under the cooperation principle, so the cooperation principle is not one of them alongside the others. It's like the umbrella principle here. All the other ones are in reference to that. All right, let's start. Actually, I want to start with quality. So, oh, um, what is that? Okay, sorry. Um, weird. With quality, there's two rules here. Don't say what you believe to be false, and don't say that for which you lack adequate evidence. Um, so in more simplified versions here, and pardon my French, don't lie and don't bullshit. Bullshitting is when people basically posture as if they know something that they really aren't in a position to know. Like when they act with like confidence of like, oh yeah, yeah, I know, what yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep. Or they're like saying something but posturing as like, I, I make this claim and uh, I'm posturing as though I'm a person who would be in a position to be able to know and have certainty that it is true. Um, so uh, the, the more technical language might be helpful with that one. Don't say that for which you lack adequate evidence. If you make claims that you're not in a position to be able to defend or justify, uh, that you don't have evidence or argument for, then you're violating the quality maxim. Um, and if you're saying things that you believe to be false, you're also violating the quality maxim. Both of them, um, both of those rules are, they're in the same category here because they both have to do with misrepresentation. Anytime a speaker is talking about things in a way where you're like, they can't possibly believe that, or that can't be actually what is going on with them, that, there's, that they are misrepresenting the situation or misrepresenting themselves, then you've got a quality violation going on here. Um, the most common form of quality violation is metaphor. Metaphor is always a quality violation. Uh, there's, I can't remember who said it, but there's some famous quote like, all poets are liars. All poets are liars. I mean, that's kind of a provocative statement, right? Um, but that's getting at this idea that uh, whenever you um, offer a metaphor, you're not intending the meaning that is the literal message of the metaphor. It's a stand-in that represents, by kind of like loose analogy, what you really intend to say. So when I say, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, you, if you're taking it literally, you're like, no, nah, that can't be right. No, he, does, he can't really believe that. What reasonable person would believe that? No, that can't be right. Quality violation, right? Um, I've got a, a text here. That was all lawyers are liars. Um, uh, I've heard that one too, but I, I, there's definitely this one about all poets are liars, and not all lawyers are liars. Not in the way in that which that quote means for the poet. Like that's plausible because all poets are intentionally representing things as not what they literally are. Right? That's what happens with poetry. With lawyers, um, they can represent things truthfully, and actually, their part of their job is to be explicit about things. That's not always the tactics that they use, but there's rhetorical things going on here as well. Um, but there, it's definitely not like everything that lawyers do at all times would count as a quality violation, to get technical about it. Maybe it was just a joke, but I'm taking it, taking it seriously. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, just being facetious. Um, so that's me not picking up on an implied meaning there, because I was, I was taking you literally, right? Uh, okay, so that's quality. Quality is about misrepresentation. Um, so don't lie, and don't say things for which you lack adequate evidence. Quantity, um, and you got some examples of that. Quantity is all about the amount of information. So quality is kind of referring to the information itself, that it's, it's a good quality information. It's not misinformation. Quantity is a matter of how much of it you're getting. And there's two sides of the boat to fall off on. And in the words of Paul Grice, you want to make your contribution as informative as is required and to not make your contribution more informative than is required. 
Um, and my, my favorite analogy for this one, or illustration that sort of shows how uh, a sensitivity to quantity can, can, it, can involve implied meanings, is with the lectures I offer. So uh, just to kind of illustrate the general expectation here, maybe, maybe you've had this happen to you in classes before. I've had it happen to me as when I was a student. Um, so we've got an exam coming up. And let's just say, again, we always have to think about the purpose of the conversation here. Let's just say, this is simplified, it's not what I really believe, but let's just say that the purpose of my lectures was exclusively to prepare you for the exams. That's definitely part of the purpose, like in the real world here. I think that is part of the purpose. It's something I'm concerned about. But there's a lot of other things I, I talk about on these lectures that isn't necessarily on the exam. Code of intellectual conduct won't be on the exam. Oh, um... I'm getting a bunch of calls here. Let me pause the video really quick here. Maybe there's something up. Sorry about that. I was afraid there was something urgent going on because I was getting the same missed call over and over. And it turns out it was a butt dial. <laughs> okay. Uh, so my apologies for the interruption. So uh, going back to this here, um, when, I'm, when I'm giving a lecture, and so we're simplifying things down, right? Like all that stuff on the Code of Intellectual Conduct, not on the exam. It's not going to be there. Um, there's... Yeah, there, I don't think there's anything on the exam about that. Um, and I might go on some tangents here that aren't directly relevant, but um, the, it is a purpose. And let's just say I was one of those teachers who like only cares about exam scores and doesn't care about you getting a real education, in my opinion. Um, let's just say it was that simplified of a scenario. If I spent all this time talking about something, like hours of lecture, and then it doesn't show up on the exam at all. You'd be like, what? Like, why do we spend all this time? I, like, studied all this stuff to prepare for this exam, and then it's not on the exam. That would be too much information for the cooperative purpose. If the cooperative purpose is to prepare for the exam, I gave a bunch of information that wasn't helpful for that. I gave you more than you needed to be able to do that, to fulfill that purpose. So that's too much information. That's a quantity violation. If I spend like five minutes talking about something and then half the exam is about that thing, then you'd also be like, ah, right? You'd be like really frustrated about that because it's like, you did not give me enough. I didn't realize that this was going to be so big of a part of my grade. And so then I'm giving you not enough information. That's also a quantity violation. The key thing about quantity is that it's all about the information, the amount of the information. And this is important because there's another kind of quantity-ish thing that's going on in the manner maxim. But we're going to distinguish that between, uh, like the manner maxim, oh, let's just skip to that. So manner maxim has uh, a principle that says, be brief. It's about brevity. And that can, the example, when you're working on example problems, Cases of brevity can be tempting to mark as quantity and vice versa. But the difference between the two is that the manner maxim is all about the way I deliver information, the way I package it up, what vehicle I put that meaning in. And so with brevity, it's a matter of how many words I'm using. So the goal here is to not use more words than I need to to convey the same amount of information, to be efficient with my use of language to convey information. With quantity, it's about the amount of the information itself, not just the words that are the vehicle for it. So that's the distinction. Is that making sense for, for you two in the chat? Okay, okay, cool. So, uh, so that's quantity. Um, let's, uh, I'm gonna leave relevance for last because I got some things to say about relevance. Um, so let's go over to manner since we were just talking about it. Now there's this, uh, there, there are these two principles under the manner maxim, avoid obscurity of expression and avoid ambiguity. There's a, there is a fun distinction to be had here between vagueness and ambiguity um, about uh, fuzzy boundaries for the concepts that we're appealing to uh, versus like words that have multiple meanings, that's ambiguity. But really what it, it all boils down to is be clear. So both avoid obscurity of expression and avoid ambiguity is a matter of clarity. And I want to um, sort of remind you about something here. Oops. Got rid of that. Yep. Here we go. 
I want to remind you about something here on the, on the chart. Oh, I should pull up the. Here we go. For the people on YouTube, remember that when we're evaluating whether a, a um, Gricean maxim has been violated, we have to stick to just the linguistic act level of meaning, right, and not anything else. So uh, it's just the the basic here. Move the camera. There we go. It's just the basic. Um, picture painted by the words based on dictionary definitions and grammar text, the robot speak version of it, the really dumbed down version of the message. That, is, that has to be clear uh, according to the Gricean maxim of manner. If it's not clear, if it doesn't paint a clear picture with the words, um, then we've got a manner violation. But that's pretty rare. That doesn't happen very often. It's only when I'm looking at those words, pulling out my dictionary, and I know how grammar works, and I'm not able to paint a very clear picture of what's happening, then we've got an issue. And I, I find that um, students mark manner violations way more commonly than they really should. Let me give you another example of this. Um, this is one that's taken from the homework, so I'm spoiling one a little bit here, but it's okay. So. Let's say, uh, do you remember, the, uh, or maybe you don't remember, but there, there's one in the book that says, someone asks someone else, where is Palo Alto? And the other person says, on the surface of the earth. And I always have students marking that as a manner violation because they think it's not clear. Um, and usually when I press them about it, the explanation that they give is like, well, there's not a lot of detail to the answer. right? It's not a very detailed answer. I found that most of my students have inherited some message from many English professors, I think, that it's like good writing, clear writing means detailed writing. Like more details, always more details, more de give me more details. And there isn't really a concern directly about more details unless it's relevant for the cooperative purpose and it's a quantity issue. And that's what's going on here. It's really not a lack of clarity as much as there's not enough information offered. There's nothing unclear about saying Palo Alto is located on the surface of the earth. I know exactly that picture is painted in perfect clarity, in perfect sharpness, if you will. It's just not very detailed. It's not giving as much information as I'm maybe looking for. And that's why it's a quantity violation and not a manner violation. So um, I understand the surface of the earth and what it would be to be on the surface of the earth. So the answer is perfectly intelligible. It paints a clear picture. No clarity violation here, so no manner violation. Um, Neil asks, if someone is being purposefully ambiguous, is that a manner violation or a quality violation? Um, so when it comes to purposely violating Gricean maxims, it doesn't have to be intentional. Or I mean, gra or, let me put it this way. Gricean maxim violations can be intentional or unintentional, but most of the time, usually intentional. That, that's how conversational implication works, is even if you're not thinking about it that way, it's not like you've studied Paul Grice's theory and you're like, oh, I know there's a manner violation. I'm going to violate that one right now. Um, it's what you're sort of implicitly doing in, in terms of your own implicit understanding of your communication. Um, that's happening. Um, and, and part of the whole point of, of Grice's theory is that we do purposefully flaunt our violation of these maxims in order to successfully communicate. Um, so the purpose thing is not going to change like which maxim is being violated. Um, so being purposefully ambiguous um, would like... Um, <laughs> I'm thinking of some congressional testimony here. Um, and, and lawyerish stuff, since you had the lawyer thing, I, I got out that on the brain. You know, a lot of times when pe like witnesses are on the stand or something, and they don't want to give certain information, but they also don't want to lie, then they're like, "Well, I'm not going to lie. I won't. I won't violate the quality maxim of misinformation. I also don't want to give the truthful information." So I'll say something that's like pretty open. It could could stand for all sorts of things, right? Like, um, not to my recollection is like one of those. Uh, I've heard some people call them weasel words or something that, um, or phrases that leaves things like pretty open, like plausible deniabilities, like all over the place here. So um, that would be more of a manner violation. Um, it could also be. Well, certain instances of it, okay, so 
some some cases of these like uh, underhanded witness tactics are manner violations because the the language that they use the phrase that's used could have been could be later taken to mean a number of different meanings and that's an ambiguity issue so that's a clarity issue and that's a manner issue but there's other times where someone just finds a way of saying something that gives a little information but not a, the satisfying amount of information that is related to the purpose of the person who asked the question um, and then it would be a quantity violation so that's what you got to listen for keep in your head this uh, principal distinction between um, the amount of what, what's going on with the words and what's going on with the information so if it's an, an issue of amount of information that's going to be quantity if it's an issue of the amount of words that's going to be manner under brevity if it's a matter of this these words could be taken to have any number of meanings or it's not a clearly defined picture of of what the person has what they are saying at this linguistic act level that's a clarity issue that's also a manner violation um, I hope that helps um, looks like there's another question here coming my answer on which question was that that you're responding to Valentina okay yeah 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 so your answer to the question was a combination of relevance and manner violations because the person changed the subject as well as an ambiguity problem it's an impolite response maybe it's a joke depends on the intonation said okay I think that analysis this is good if you don't mind I'm gonna use this as, as sort of an example for everybody here this is good practice um, I think a lot of your answer is not sticking to just the linguistic act level of meaning but it's sort of considering the whole picture of conversational implication and you and you gotta hold off on that so before we're doing all the other exciting stuff here uh, like the second half of explaining how the conversational implication is generated there's just this first half of uh, detecting the breach right what is weird about this and all I'm holding are the Gricean maxims in one hand and the literal meaning and the speech act in the other and those are the things that that's what I'm comparing against the Gricean maxims so it, it doesn't it, it shouldn't have all the rest of it in there so it's not a relevance violation because they answered the question like like and, and it's not a quality violation because it's truthful Palo Alto is on the surface of the earth right um, that's on topic with what the questioner was asking for so it's not a relevance violation we'll talk about relevance violations next um, and I don't think it's a manner violation this is a this is a quantity issue there's clear information given just not enough of it not enough details okay? and that's going to be in the category of amount of information so it makes it quantity there's no ambiguity with this on the surface of the earth is perfectly clear I mean that only stands for one meaning I can't use those words to mean something else um, it's not like on the surface of the earth what would you mean which which earth which surface or something like that right what sense of surface are we talking about here right um, it, it's like the old famous joke about Bill Clinton like depends on what you mean by is <laughs> right I mean that's that's an unnecessary that that's probably like cranking up the the ambiguity detector way too sensitively does that make sense to you Valentina okay final thing about your answer that's noteworthy here you say maybe it's a joke depends on the intonation said so I want to get around to this sooner or later um, I'm kind of in the middle of things with the manner violation but maybe it's okay for me to take a little tangent on this so um, a lot of times conversational implication does happen with the context of things like tone of voice and body language and facial expressions and all that stuff but what's really going on there is that you have multiple linguistic acts taking place at the same time right if a linguistic act is just expressing a meaning in a language then when we're talking like especially video and voice and you know this kind of interaction like face-to-face -face interaction we're expressing ourselves in a multimedia sort of way there's a multimodal expression happening there's the just a uh, logical conceptual meaning of the words that I'm employing there is the the semantic conventions around tone of voice 
like what that communicates or represents. Like if I'm talking really quietly, if I'm talking really fast, if I'm talking really loud, if I'm talking really slow, or some like those all have associated meanings with them that are expressive. They're they're all all their own linguistic acts. Facial expression, same thing, same thing with body language. What happens in those kinds of cases is how um, what is the literal meaning from one modality of expression to another are not all on the same page. So if I'm like, oh no, yes, please tell me more of this story, then there's a disconnect, right? The message of what my words are saying and the message you're getting from my body language and tone of voice are like disconnected. Right? They're going in very different directions. So that's something weird. That's like inconsistent meaning. So it's like if you're just if I'm just supposed to take you at face value, like you're not communicating in a very effective way. You're giving mixed messages. That's not very clear. Right? So that's a separate kind of issue. On the exam and on the homework problems, I don't want you worrying about that. For the same reason I don't want you worrying about irony or or um uh, I'm sorry, not, I said irony earlier. I meant sarcasm. I, that was a, that was a uh, rookie mistake. Just wrong choice of words there. Irony's got other issues too here, but um, sarcasm is the worst. Don't read any sarcasm into the homework problems or the exam problems um, because it's going to make this kind of effect. When, and, and usually the, the, the mechanism of this, of how it works in us psychologically with background assumptions, is that we have assumptions that um, the nonverbal forms of communication are more honest or indicative of someone's real mood. Why? Because it's a little harder for us to mask those things. We can say whatever we want, but we, ex we emote in nonverbal ways in, in ways that are harder to control. They just sort of come out um, <clears throat> most of the time. There are certain people who are really good liars <laughs> who can like misrepresent themselves in all of the ways that they have of communicating. But generally, this is a, a, a rarer skill to have. It's harder to develop and cultivate. So we have a background assumption most of the time, not everyone, um, that prioritizes whatever is the linguistic act level of meaning that you get from the nonverbal sources. The, the verbal source is going to be just discredited. It's just going to be tossed out in favor of prioritizing the nonverbal uh, message. That's a complicated case that I'm I'm not wanting you to track because I it, honestly it'll put you into paranoia mode um, because and maybe you've noticed this about like text message conversations or forum posts on the internet or something but like you can take any written text and read it all sorts of different tones of voices and get very different meanings and misunderstanding is easy to do so when it comes to our especially I'm thinking about the exam here. Just don't worry about that kind of thing. Don't put that in there. Um, don't don't put some sauce um, or sass on top of the words that you're being given to work with. Make sense? Cool. Awesome. All right, let's finish off manner here. Um, so, oh, that's the wrong thing. Where is it? Here we go. So we have uh, this avoid vagueness and ambiguity. That's basically clarity stuff. We talked about brevity. And then finally, uh, there's an expectation for us to be orderly. So my favorite example for this would be, let's say you ask me, uh, Tim, how do you bake a cake? And I'm like, well, first you take the pan out of the oven. Um, and then you put the batter in the pan. And then you uh, crack the eggs. Um, and then put the frosting on it, and um, and this sort of thing. If I'm just kind of giving you all the steps, but they're all mixed up, I mean, the implication is going to be that the order in which I tell you the, the conditions necessary for baking a cake are the order in which they should be performed. So oftentimes there, there's like, it depends on the cooperative purposes of the talk exchange, of course, um, but the goal will be that, or the expectation will be that the order in which information is provided will make logical sense based on why you want the information, what the purpose of getting that information is. So like in the case of why would you want to know the conditions for baking a cake? So I can do it. I want to know how to do it. And so 
part of what's important about following a step-by-step -step procedure is to do the steps in the right order. So why would I mix them up? It makes no sense. Whatever order in which I tell you them, that's the implication, the implied meaning that's involved there, even if I never say it explicitly, is that you do this first, you do this second, you do this third, and so on. Um, I think I, actually, when I just told the story, I used words like then. That would explicitly represent order. But let's just say, well, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. You're going to assume that the order in which I tell them is the order in which you're supposed to do them. This is also pretty rare. The most common, I mean, manner violations just in general are rare. I would put it that way. Um, I do think it's somewhat useful to expand manner a little bit more um, than um, what the book has listed here, and maybe even that Paul Grice puts in there. Um, anything that's about the the vehicle rather than the content. That's the key. With quantity, quality, and relevance, all of those three maxims are really about the contents of the information that I'm trying to convey in the message. Manner is all about the language I've decided to employ to package it up. Okay. So, uh, for for instance, um, here here's another, here's another good one that I think is a manner violation. Um, think about how when I'm I get this response all the time because it's, well, I'm a philosopher. Um, and philosophers have big vocabularies. And sometimes, I, I, without trying to, I, it sometimes happens by accident that there's a lot of big words that sort of creep into how I express myself. And, and there's purpose to it. I mean, bigger words, esoteric words, SAT words, uh, are useful. Philosophers use them because they are more precise. You can express yourself with greater... Uh, clarity and give more information. So there's some good rational reasons for doing it. But um, sometimes I have this reaction when I'm talking to someone that they're getting the message that I'm trying, I'm basically um, trying to demonstrate my superiority or show off or something like that. Because for me to communicate using words that my audience can't understand violates Gricean maxim of manner. Because I'm not able to at least be clear for them, right? Or there's something distracting about this um, that keeps them from being able to have a more efficient contact with the meanings that I'm intending to convey. They're having to dredge through the words. Um, so they might even know the, my audience might even know the words, but they're just harder. They'll be like, oh yeah, that's right. That word means that. Rather than just using ordinary language that they're already very familiar with and don't have to think twice about. Um, that's still going to be in the in the case of of manner. So sort of e efficiency that's that's connected with brevity. Um, that that'll be a manner violation. There are some manner violations in the homework problems and could be on the exam. Wink wink. Could be on the exam. May, maybe not. Maybe yes. Not saying it one way or the other. Not too much. The only implication. I, I I'm being very suggestive here in my body language and conveying an implication. But what the message I really want to have is that like it's something you got to be on the lookout for. Expectation on the exam is that you're going to be tracking manner violations. But uh, be, just be careful to not have the sensitivity ratcheted up too high and you start marking everything as a manner when it violation when it's not. Manner violations are fairly rare when it comes to the three. Well, the most common uh, maxim that gets violated by us is relevance. Relevance is definitely the biggie here. And in some ways that makes sense because the relevance maxim can sound a lot like just the cooperation principle. Make your conversational contribution such as is required at the stage at which it occurs by the accepted purpose or direction of the talk exchange in which you're engaged. Make your con conversational contribution relevant to the purpose of the talk exchange. That's basically what that's saying. And relevance is saying just that. Be relevant towards satisfying the cooperative goal. Whatever is your contribution in the conversation, needs to be on task for what we're trying to do here. And that could be all sorts of things, right? So um, <laughs> uh, most of my friends were theater majors and comedians uh, when I was in college. And so for me to like uh, get into philosophy all the time in conversations, sometimes that wasn't the purpose of the conversation they were trying to have. Like they're just trying to be goofy and have fun and it's supposed to be entertaining banter rather than to like do some serious critical truth seeking here and and I my old my I think they influenced my personality in a positive way I used to, used to be much more literal 
because I was spending so much time in the philosophy world, and uh, and so I, I would just be kind of I was like kind of a gullible person. I guess I still am somewhat of a gullible person. That I I have so much charity. Um, I tr I try to be very sincere, so I like take people at face value. Oh, maybe you just think that you know like. I'm used to not making assumptions in philosophy about what people believe and what they don't believe because I know there's lots of perspectives out there. So sometimes a person is trying to, say, intentionally violate the quality maxim or something to flaunt that. And I'm like, oh, they, you really think that? Hmm, okay, well, why, do, why would you think that? You know, I'm, I'm just taking them seriously when they're not intending for that to happen. So then my contributions are not relevant right, um, toward the cooperative goal. And there can be, you know, of course you can have conversations where people have different ideas about what the cooperative goal is. I mentioned that uh, rom-com scenario uh, in the last lecture where one person thinks they're going on a date, the other person thinks they're just hanging out with a buddy. Um, I, I was using that, that scene, if you will, as a way to describe how there can be differences of an understanding of what a speech act is, of like what it would mean to ask someone out on a date, and presumably because the two parties involved have a different sense of what the conventions for behavior are with speech acts, they have a different sense of what the cooperative purpose of their conversation is when they're having their meal. And that's where we can get now into the same scenario used as an example for this. Um, if, if they have these different understandings of what is the purpose of them having dinner together and talking, then you can imagine what kind of like sitcom comedy could 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 happen right like one person says one thing and they think they're sending this message and the other person's like oh they're saying this message like what you know like um and they could then you know hilarium ensues they misinterpretation and then eventually it gets to some extreme point where they realize like oh that's not what i'm saying you're you think i'm doing oh right so that can kind of thing could happen um so ha but uh Paul Grice is saying not that any time people talk to each other, they're on the same page about their cooperative purpose. It's just the expectation that we're trying to meet on that. And we might be taking it for granted that we have an understanding about that when we don't, and that's what can get us into trouble. Um, but when we don't, when we know that we're not on the same page about it, then it can be either a case where we have to talk about it directly and try to square that away, or what the other scenario that I'm familiar with happening in the actual world is when people just start to bully the other person into part playing by their rules or to adopt their purpose. Um, so that's another thing that can happen. So they may not talk explicitly about it, but there's still there's always in all of these different variations. I think Paul Grice is onto something in saying that when we're trying to communicate, we're trying to get on the same page one way or the other, even if it's antagonistic even if it's an, uh, you and I are enemies or something, or where there's a battle of wills taking place for what this interaction is going to be about. I've definitely had students who try to pick fights with me in my classes. They're like trying to rile me up. They're, it's like real life trolling, like in real life trolling. Um, that they're, they're trying to get me into this kind of like intellectual wrestling match thing. And I want to do cooperative truth seeking with them. And so... Sometimes, we, I, usually I'm the one who's trying to talk about that explicitly and be like, here, here's what I'm about here. What are you about? You know, let, I want to understand. And then we can figure out how to proceed in this conversation. But sometimes they're, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm doing a sincere truth-seeking thing too. But they, there's ulterior motives going on. And they're, th those are extreme cases. Um, Valentina asks, do you mean that manner violations are a lot about using the sophisticated language that audience may not understand? Is it what the book tells about obscurity of expression? Yes, that's part of obscurity of, of expression, but not. I don't want to suggest that most, or definitely not all, or even most manner violations are about sophisticated language. Um, even common words have ambiguity to them. Um, for example, I was talking about this with my 101 students this morning. Um, we're doing a topic in philosophy called personal identity. Um, but the word identity gets thrown around for very different conceptual logical meanings. Now, it is somewhat sophisticated because most people aren't tracking those differences in meaning, but they're definitely using them in different ways. So, for example, um, do I have an example? Yes, I do. Are these two pens the same? Are they the same pen? 
In a sense, yes, and in a sense, no. They're the same in that they share the same qualities, like they're pretty much identical in terms of their qualities, but they're not the same pen. There's one pen over here and one pen over here. There's two pens. They're not the same individual pen. We use the word identity and sameness and difference in with respect to both of those concepts, and we don't always distinguish them. So that would be sort of also manner violations if we're not specifying what we mean by that or there's any question about it without it having to be something sophisticated. A lot of times, at least in philosophy, a lot of the sophistication comes through having to deal with the fact that our linguistic system or our linguistic behavior has ambiguity issues built into it. Like the conventions are designed in awkward ways. Um, we were talking about lang languages that are planned versus languages that just sort of evolve the other day. But, but yeah, is, does that answer your question, Valentina? Cool. I, just to kind of summarize again with, with Manor, the overarching pattern of what kind of weirdness is going to count as a Manor violation weirdness, Manor is all about the, the, the language packaging, the, the language, the words as a vehicle for a meaning, not the meaning that is the content as much as the packaging. They're all issues related to the packaging. Okay, getting into relevance though, um, in detail. There, because the relevance principle is so close to the cooperation principle, it's very tempting, and students have done this all the time, to put relevance violations for every single thing that ever happens. Uh, like all the homework problems. There, there is an, uh, I'll just warn you right now, I'll let this cat out of the bag. There is an exercise that has mostly relevance violation problems. Uh, that's on the homework. So when you run into that, don't be like, it's relevance. It's relevance, right? Wait, Tim said that not everything is a relevance violation. Am I doing something wrong? I'm just going to be explicit about it with you right now. No, you're not doing something wrong. And it is still true that you can go overboard with relevance violations as your diagnosis of what's going on that's weird with what someone's literally saying and doing. But there's two, to so that you're not like lost about this, here's my advice. There's two really clear-cut cases of relevance that I want you to have on your radar for the exam. Real life, it's slightly more complicated, but even just the, this advice will get you a long way. Um, 99 out of 100 times. Relevance violations are paradigmatically either changing the subject or something I like to just call like saying things out of the blue. So... Changing the subject has got to be actually changing the subject. So saying, that's why I was saying, um, uh, where is Palo Alto on the surface of the earth? I mean, that's not a relevance violation. That answer is on topic. Um, I'll spoil one other homework problem here. I'm trying to avoid this a little bit. But um, on the homework, uh, there's a question that someone asks, um, what did you get on the last test? and the person says, a grade. That's not a relevance violation. They're, they're giving information that is on topic with what the question was asking. Whenever there's a question going on in a conversation, <clears throat> I mean, someone asking a question sets a cooperative purpose for the talk exchange. Unless the speaker wants to say, I refuse to answer your question, which is itself a response, I mean, just asking the question s demands an answer. Even if the answer is a non-answer, like, I'm not going to answer that question, I'm not going to tell you, or something like that. It still requires something like that. It sets a cooperative purpose for the talk exchange when someone asks a question. Um, so changing the subject's got to be something a little more drastic than that. Um, uh, there's the, um, what did you think of her singing? Her dress was beautiful. That's changing the subject. Right? That information does not address the question that was asked. So that would be a changing the subject situation. The saying things out of the blue is when is, is basically a relevance violation, not because they, the contribution is irrelevant, it's that there's a lack of purpose. So like we were talking about with conversational acts, so much of it is about, where? come on, camera, camera, move, move, there we go. 
um, so much of it's about purpose, intentions, motives, and goals, right? That if I don't have one of those, that's weird. Like, like I said, we're always tracking for this conversational act level of analysis. We're not just waiting for there to be something that I already had the, the purpose set up and then it was thwarted somehow. One of my other expectations is that there will be a purpose to the conversation. And I've got some fun examples of this. Um, so let's, uh, it's so much better when I'm doing it in the classroom. But I, I go up to you and I say, um, would you mind if I borrowed your pen? book does a good job talking through an example like this. Would you mind if I borrowed your pen? And you say, let's say, no. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then I walk away. Be like, what just happened? What What's going on here? When I, when I ask, um, uh, would you mind if I borrowed your pen? What's the sort of linguistic act level of meaning do we get? Well, if we just pull out our dictionary, and our grammar text, and we figure this out, we'd say something like, um, would you be, um, like this is the robot speak version, um, would you be emotionally disturbed under the hypothetical situation under which I took temporary ownership of your writing utensil? So for me to ask that question and then to not do anything, like you give, you give me the answer, no, I wouldn't mind. I'm like, cool. Then you're like, why did he ask that question? What's the purpose of receiving that information? Now, the implied meaning here is what I'm really saying on a, on a standard context would be something like, um, I request to borrow your pen. I request to take temporary ownership of it. And how could the, the basic meaning, the literal meaning, be a vehicle for that meaning? Well, based on relevance that without identifying this purpose that I want to take your pen, want to take temporary ownership of your pen, there's no reason why I'd be interested in what would your emotional state be under that hypothetical situation. Like if I was thinking about actually making the hypothetical situation a really existing situation, then, um, then it would make sense that I'd want to inquire about that because I want to be respectful, background assumptions, right, to help explain this. Um, Generally, people want to be respectful about things like that. We'd know about things like property rights and that for me to just take it would be wrong, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's kind of like the politeness is a matter of, um, I want to make this request of you, but I'm not so interested in prioritizing my needs over everyone else's that I would want you to do that if it was going to be a big problem for you. right? Like I'd only want to make the request if that was convenient for you to let to lend me the pen okay so this is how the saying things out of the blue things works it's when someone offers a conversational contribution and there's no established purpose for it then that's weird and what we need to do is as the audience as the listener is to find a purpose that would have that linguistic utterance make rational sense that there would be something behind it and that will color how i understand the implied meaning Right, the implied meaning will be getting into that. I'll have to speculate about that stuff. That's why maybe you can see how the conversational act um, level of analysis involves implied meanings and implied doings and purposes, motives, and goals, and all that good stuff. Um, they go hand in hand. They're, they're, they work together to inform each other. Um, Valentina says, I think it's impolite to respond grade on that question, what did you get on the last test? The book tells about politeness in the manner rule. I might be mistaken, but to me, politeness is a red flag for manner examples. Um, a little bit, yes, in the sense like if I'm, if I'm choosing language to express myself that is more um, provocative than it needs to be or something like that, then I, I could see that being a manner violation. Um, but it, it's also probably going to be a relevance violation, too. Um, the the A grade thing, I'm not sure why that's rude. I mean, what I definitely think would be inappropriate would be to have this calibrated up where if someone asks you a question, then you must respond um, in the way that they want. Like, they want the information. 
but it is a perfectly relevant response to a question. It's totally fair to say, I, I don't want to answer your question. I refuse to answer your question. That's fine. Um, to say a grade is basically to imply, I don't want to answer your question. I'm not going to tell you. Right? The implied meaning in that problem would be, I'm not going to tell you. Um, refusing to answer the question is not something rude in and of itself. How it's done, yes, maybe. And that's where it's getting into manner, right? The how, the, the vehicle of words that I'm using to package up the meaning, is that well, that's where it's going. But I, I warn you about going too much on that. Uh, also for another reason. Standards of politeness differ from place to place. Like people have different background assumptions about what constitutes polite behavior and what doesn't. Conversational implication is that it's most effective when it's working on background assumptions that are commonly shared. So if you want to be a good listener, one of the things you're always having to watch out for is to not be projecting what, how you think about meaning onto what the speaker is. Sort of recognizing we come from different places, right? Um, so when I'm, I'm having to put words in your mouth that you haven't necessarily said, and that's what I'm doing when I'm doing conversational implication, I better have a really good rationale for it. And the better rationales are the ones that don't involve more controversial background assumptions. Things that I can kind of count that we're on the same page about. Again, why the Gricean maxims as universal expectations, that's why it's so important to have those universal expectations for making conversational implication work. Um, so that's, that's getting into some other uh, more sophisticated details here of, of what's happening with the theory. Those are all the Gricean maxims to cover um, and the scenarios in which they occur. Um, I think we'll probably want to be discussing stuff about this. Uh, I would love to see some more posts on the discussion page of the Canvas site um, so that I can answer questions for you as we go along. I know with this unit, you know, now we're just finishing up the video lectures for Chapter 2 material. Um, and so uh, maybe now you know, like, what things are making sense and what things are not. But don't be shy about contacting um, me through either the discussion board um, or texting me or calling me, um, all those good things. Especially as you do the homework this weekend, um, I will probably, you know, I'm thinking, I had this thought and I was like, yeah, I mean, what else am I going to do? I, I'm, I'm already uh, being um, going to be flexible with a number of students this quarter in terms of making things work with uh, homework dates uh, when homework is due. And it's an online class, so a lot of times you are taking, I mean, I'm imagining many of you, I know some of you for sure, are taking this class online because you're trying to like do a juggling act with a busy schedule, work life, family, all sorts of stuff. Um, so making the class a little more flexible about like due dates and stuff, that, that's fine with me. Um, you, want, you want to kind of stay on things like I've given advice before about how to be a student in this class. But... Um, I'm talking about this again because I'm thinking about just making the homework answers available. Like I'm not going to try to police this stuff or anything. Um, so I'm probably going to send them out. I'm probably going to send out the answers to the homework in the weekend update email. I just strongly encourage you to not look at the answers before trying it out for yourself. Don't. I, I, a lot of students in in this class, and I've taught it dozens of times, um, have said that they're like, "Yeah, I." got a hold of the, like like a student who's turning it in late for me. They're like, yeah, you sent it out to everybody after the due date was in, and I took a look at them before doing the answers because I didn't know what to do. I wanted to see some examples. And I actually think it'll serve you better as a student to give it a shot without having a sneak peek at those answers. Try to work it out on your own. Um, try to uh, develop strategies for how to answer the principled things that these questions are all asking for on your own, then compare it against the answers, and then kind of like figure out like where is your mind, you'll, you'll get a much better sense of where your mind is at if you do it that way. Um, this isn't about getting right answers as much as training analytic techniques, because we sometimes will get different answers. I alluded to that in the first week. We've got different background assumptions that inform how we do this uh, interpretation of implication, um, and I don't care if you have a different answer than me. If you, I can tell from your explanation that you're using the right uh, techniques of this analytic system. That's what I care about the most. Um, so you'll have a much better idea of where you're coming at with that and how your brain is sort of, your mind is calibrated to think about these things 
if you have to do this stuff on your own first before looking at the answers I'm I'm giving out. So uh, so that's my advice. Do the homework first, even though if I give if you're doing the homework after I send out the answers, don't look at them. You know, don't treat it like game facts for video games or something like that. Like do it on your own, then compare it against my answers. And if there's any inconsistencies there that you're not able to explain or see, oh, yeah, Tim's just thinking this way, so he got a different answer. But, yeah, I'm confident I'm using this technique properly and competently. Um, if you have, even if you do feel that way, I mean, it doesn't hurt to check in with me and double-check something. But especially if you don't have confidence about that that's what's happening, and that's why we have different answers. Or you don't understand why I have the answers that I do. Or, or you don't know how would I have figured out like that was the thing that I needed to be focusing my attention on to answer that question or give that explanation call me up let's talk about that let's touch base about it and I can give you some more specialized advice um, th with this first kind of like official homework assignment coming up um, it's worth reiterating again something I said in the first week which is that in no other class that I teach do I see as much diversity of where students are coming from and like what skills they have under their belt and which ones they don't. Uh, and where, what are sort of your proclivities as a reasoner. Uh, they're very different from everyone else in the class. And uh, I try to explain all the material in a way that like uh, anticipates possible difficulties. I've mentioned some of those in the lecture today, in, in fact. Um, but when I know, if we're able to have some more one-on-one -on -one contact um, and I'm able to look at your answers and kind of see what's going on with that, then I can give you some more specialized feedback. Um, but again, the ball will be in your court about this. When I'm looking at your homework submissions, I'll just be plopping a grade on there because you did it. As long as I see that you did it, I'm going to give you the credit for it. Um, I won't be able to go through meticulously through all of your homework submissions and say, this is right, this is wrong, that kind of thing. Um, so there's a kind of self-advocacy um, uh, need here. Um, but I, ha I have time. I'm available. You just have to look me up, and, and you'll get my time. So please don't be shy about that. Um, <clears throat> I need to give a code. Swamp Thing is the code this time around for this video. Um, my friend wh whose uh, birthday was yesterday, or no, no, he, uh, my other friend whose birthday, he was in town visiting, um, lent me a bunch of Alan Moon's Swamp Thing. So maybe when I'm done with this quarter, I'll read it. But Swamp Thing was on my mind. I was just talking about it with him yesterday. So Swamp Thing will be the code word. One final thing before we leave today. Um, oh, uh, by the way, people in chat, um, any questions before we kind of leave the material of, the, of this lecture behind? No? Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you again for being here. Um, but before we go, uh, I'm going to pull up this document that I'm going to send you in the weekend update email this weekend. And it's called Writing Assignment 1. And you'll see it up here on the screen. Uh, let me change that. There we go. Um, I'm showing it up here. For those of you on YouTube watching this later, you'll be able to see this. For those of you in the chat, uh, you it should be up on the Canvas site in the file section. But you can kind of hear what I'm saying about it. And, and definitely I'll be sending out the document so you can review it for yourself here too. But um, this writing assignment has... Uh, it's sort of almost like a writing project. It's going to have multiple phases to it. And it's something I want you to be kind of working on over the next couple units. So over the next week, week and a half. Um, so it's not due immediately. And I do recommend taking it in a step-by-step -step way to not doing it all at once at the last minute or something like that. Do it one step at a time as we get through the relevant material. But this is going to be really awesome practice for the exam. Over the next couple units, the Chapter 3 and Chapter 5 material, we're going to be putting together the skills to do extend what I'm going to call extended argumentative reconstruction. Basically, to be able to take a passage of argumentative prose and carve it up and diagram the logic of the argument that is being expressed in that essay, in that paragraph, in what that person was saying. That kind of thing. It's a very, very valuable skill. So we're taking the, the general listening skills that we're working on with this linguistic analysis unit on Chapter 2, but then we're going to be adapting them more specifically to what's happening with this particular speech act and conversational act 
of arguing and debate. So um, being able to like really pin down what is the the structure and content of uh, the argumentative appeals of, of someone's argument, that's what we're going to be working on. And there's a bunch of different skills involved with that, some more detailed things. And this writing assignment is going to test your competency with those skills at a much higher challenge level than what the homework problems from chapter 3 and 5 test you at. Those problems are a little more canned. They're a little more like cherry-picked, low-hanging fruit sorts of things, and not the kinds of scenarios that you will have in the real world. They're, they're really, they're, they tend to be more simplistic. They require less judgment calls. They're trying to slap you in the face a little bit more with what's happening. And, and I want you to have something more robust, especially because on the exam, I'm not going to give you layups for this section. I am going to be giving you some more real world types of uh, examples. Uh, one will be sort of casual conversation. The other one is actually going to be taken from some philosophy. So it's, it'll be a little bit more academic, a little more technical, um, but, but still accessible. It's not going to be like you need to have a philosophy degree to understand it or something like that. But because the exam is at a higher level of difficulty than, um, than what the homework problems are asking you for, I'm stretching you a little further with this writing assignment so that if you're, if you're feeling good with this writing assignment, that's harder than what the exam is going to be like. But if you're feeling good with that, then you, you can be much more confident with the, with the exam uh, problems that you'll be facing off against. Um, so that's the purpose of this assignment. The thing that I can tell you about right now is that the first step of it is really straightforward. And if you just do it, I'm going to give you credit for that part of it. Um, that's the grading for effort that I have in the rubric here. But all you got to do is just compose a 500 word essay where you argue for something. It could be on anything. I don't care. I really mostly care that you, like I say here, advice request, please have it be something you care about. Like, don't, don't troll me. Like, do, do something that, you, that matters to you. Um, so, uh, and, and write, the, the other advice I have is write naturally. Just write very informally. Don't write an academic paper. Don't make this into a formal style kind of essay. Uh, please don't use something that you wrote for another class, too. I always feel like I have a lot of students that do that with this assignment. Please don't do that. Just write out something and don't edit it. Don't edit it. It's not in the, I don't want this part of the assignment to be the painful part. Just barf something out. And, and, the, and there's a reason for doing it this way. The more that you just write this essay in the natural way in which you might just talk with someone, like a friend you're shooting the shit, and like having a debate and be like, hey, this is something I care about. Here are my reasons for it. Um, the more you do it in what is your sort of natural mode of expression, the more that doing the assignment, the, the other parts of the analysis that will come later, doing that part of it might actually yield some insights of like self-awareness about what your proclivities and tendencies are as an arguer. Like, what kind of strategies do you use? What kinds of tactics? Um, what style, uh, form of arguments do you employ to try to generally justify your positions and make your case for things? Um, I've had some students report that this assignment is, is kind of just really cool for uh, getting that out of it. And I think the best chance you have of, of receiving that benefit, not all students that have done this assignment have received that benefit, I think, but your best chances for that happening would be if you just write it very naturally as naturally as you can and don't agonize over it. Um, maybe do a little bit of like grammar, spelling, editing, but don't edit it for content or, and don't be, uh, try, I mean, I can't tell you, don't be embarrassed. I can't control your emotions, but don't let embarrassment or fear of embarrassment kind of stop you from doing this or turning it in. Um, I'm not going to be grading you based on how good your arguments are. Really, the purpose of composing the essay is just to give yourself some raw material with which to analyze. Because again, we're not at the stage of this class where we're evaluating the arguments yet. We're just trying to listen to hear what the arguments are to pave the way for evaluating them. And this might also happen to you when you do this assignment. I've had students before definitely report this where they're like, I wrote the essay, felt pretty good about it. Like I actually, I was proud of it. Like I was like, there's some good arguments in there. Then I had to diagram my arguments. And then I was like, oh, these arguments are bad. <laughs> these don't make sense. 
Um, so sometimes it, that that's that tickles me because I'm like, yep, that's the whole point of doing this kind of analysis. The more clarity we can bring to understanding exactly what are the arguments, it becomes a little easier to do the evaluative step, a little more straightforward. And it never makes it perfectly easy, but anything we can do to make something that's fuzzy and weird and difficult just slightly less fuzzy and weird and difficult, that's that's a useful thing to the critical thinker. So so that's what we're going to be, that's what's coming up here. Um, I'll be attaching those instructions in, uh, or I'll be, I'll be mentioning them in the weekend update email. The, uh, or I, it's not an email. I keep saying that. That's for all my other classes. I'll be making an announcement post. That's the weekend update, and I'll mention it there, and then you'll find it in the module for the next unit. And and also just as a kind of uh, foreshadowing here, um, I'm going to be trying to move quickly next week through three and five. So I'm going to kind of smoosh them together a little bit. Um, but just be prepared for that. If you want to kind of get a head start on things, um, I would recommend reading both chapters over the weekend. Um, and then I'll be, I'll be moving through the lectures a little more quickly so that we can get to exam one more quickly too, because this quarter is so dreadfully short. So um, I'm looking, in case you're curious, which I'm sure you are, uh, we're, we'll be ready for exam one after we're done with the chapter five material. And so the next, like, chapter three, chapter five material, that, that's going to be um, that's going to be the signaling point for when we're going to do exam one. So I'm thinking exam one opened up in, like, a week and a half, something like that. Um, I, I, I'm going to do some more careful thinking about the schedule, but uh, I, might, I might actually record an, a supplement video this weekend just to kind of get the ball rolling a little bit more. Um, I'll, I'll do, it'll be a short one where I kind of give a broad overview of the next two units and what's going to happen. I usually like to start my lectures on chapter three stuff doing that of like, here's what it's going to look like. It may not make sense right now, but at least you've got a roadmap for navigating everything that we're going to be up to. So you got a, a vision at least of, of where we're headed, what our destination is. So I, I might do that this weekend and post that, but I'll be letting you know what's up. So uh, I think that's everything for this video. I think there's nothing else I wanted to talk about. So unless there's anything in the chat, I'll bid you adieu. Um, how are we doing, chat? Anything else? Last chance to dance? Cool. Thank you again, both of you, for, for coming. I'm happy you liked the lecture. Uh, great. That's cool to hear. Um, Hope to see you around next time. And I'll see all the rest of you next time on YouTube. So, so long. Have a great weekend.